delight in your children and love each of us unconditionally. Thank you that you welcome us into your family. Please draw us closer to you. Thank you that we can trust you and that you are faithful. Help us to walk in that assurance each day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. On this Father's Day, we remember fathers all over the world. We give you thanks for the father figures in our own lives. We pray you would give your wisdom, your strength, your protection and guidance. And on this day, we pray for those that are grieving, for those who need forgiveness or are struggling to forgive. We ask for healing and restoration in relationships and in families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we give you thanks for all the children baptized at St. Mark's last month and over the past year. May these children grow in your love and walk in your path. Please bless their families. May they find a place of belonging in their church family. And we pray for the baptism picnic taking place next week at St. Mark's, where all the baptism families will gather to celebrate and fellowship together. And we thank you for the group of volunteer baptism visitors who visit the families before every baptism. We thank you for the connections they make with each family and for the welcome they provide. Please bless this ministry and may it bear much fruit for your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the most vulnerable people in our society and those that are in need. We pray for charities around the world who look to support others, who look to bring light to the darkness and to bring hope to the hopeless. We pray for missionaries working around the world, sharing your love and sharing Jesus' message with your people. We pray for our mission partners, Latin Link, working with local churches in Latin America and Europe as they share the gospel message. And we pray for Paul and Ruth Turner that you would provide for them and protect them as they support leaders and teams in Peru. We also remember charities that are supporting people with mental health issues. And we ask that through healthcare workers and charities, through counselors and other professionals, you would bring your healing, your restoration, your peace and hope. We pray for the local charity Wellspring that provide counseling to our local community. We pray for your provision for them that they can continue with the amazing work that they are doing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, we pray for those people and places that you have placed on our hearts this week. And in a moment of silence, we bring to God those people we know that are in need of his love, his healing, his peace and restoration. <coughs> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you, God, that you hear our prayers. May your kingdom come and your will be done. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. 
this news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. This is the word of the Lord. James, come on up. Let's pray for you. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and anoint James to speak into our hearts and minds this morning with your words. As he explains his passage to us, may we be open to see its application for our lives. For your kingdom's sake. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much for that, Mike. Uh, as, uh, as Mike said, my name is James, and I'm part of the team here at St. Mark's. Uh, but my main job in the week is as a software developer at a flood risk management company. Um, so that's why you don't see me around quite so much as, uh, as the other guys on the team. Uh, so this morning we're looking at this passage in Ruth, uh, sorry, in Luke, um, and uh, I just got a sense that, that this this is potentially quite a difficult passage for some people. I know Father's Day can be a difficult day, and then this is a passage about um, someone who's lost their, their husband and then their son and, and is at the funeral. Um, so uh, it's just fair warning in a way that this is some of the stuff we'll be digging into. Um, the backdrop of that is our God is a God of, of compassion and of healing. And I, I believe wants to bring healing and peace in those situations. We'd love to pray with you. Um, or, or if there are dis- issues to deal with that, you know, Gail was signposting to Wellspring and other things like that. You know, we'd love, love to walk with you um, if, if any of these things do, do touch your heart this morning. So that was a bit heavy, wasn't it? Uh, so the other thing to say is I'm standing here because we, we are, the microphone isn't quite working properly. I'd much rather be kind of roaming around, but I'm, I'm pinned down today, which may be a blessing to be fair. Although if I get very excited and, you know, start preaching, just, uh, just kind of give me strange looks and I'll stop. Okay, so here we are back, uh, back in the book of Luke. So uh, the church generally has a, a, an annual cycle of, of Bible readings. And um, each year is designated a specific gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and and it alternates year by year. And this year, it's the year of Luke, so we've been working through it. We had a a little bit of a pause for for Lent and for Easter, and and we had a a wonderful session exploring the work and the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, But now we're kind of diving back into Luke to to pick up the threads and and work through that, that amazing gospel. Um, so Luke was written by, uh, by a doctor, by a physician, and, um, and it's kind of, we increasingly think, written together with Acts, so kind of Luke and Acts go together as a, as a, a two-volume piece. Um, and some of the key themes that we see in Luke's Gospel are about the poor uh, and the disadvantaged and this reversal of power in the kingdom of God, that actually the, the rich and the famous people aren't the important ones in the kingdom of God. It's the poor, it's the disadvantaged, it's the widows, it's the orphans. So we see this reversal of power, and I I spoke about that that previously. Um, And the other, I think, key theme we see in Luke's gospel is the work and the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so we're going to be kind of going through the, uh, the, the passage in quite a close reading. So you might like to have, have your Bibles open. There, there's some in the pews. Um, or if you've got an app, you can, uh, you can pull it up on that. Uh, on the Bibles and the pews, it's around page uh, 1045 towards the back. And we're just going to be kind of looking through each verse and just picking out some thoughts and trying to really dig into it. Um, so the other thing, of course, that's going on today is it, is it is Father's Day. This passage, I don't think, has an awful lot to say and to speak into Father's Day. So that, that's not kind of where I'm going. Um, but as a concession to that, I thought I'd put in some dad jokes, if that's all right. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the great privileges of being a father is the chance to embarrass your children. Um, and, uh, and a few years ago, we, we did a silent disco here. And, uh, and I was asked to help promote this. So um, the youth worker at the time came up and was saying all about the silent disco. And, and I came on at the back with a big pair of headphones on and, you know, was pretending I was dancing to a silent disco and changing the music on my headphone. Um, and afterwards, someone came up to me and said, oh, you know, James, that was, that was so good. That was brilliant. You had your dad cardigan on and you did your dad dancing. And, and I was, well, I, it's just my normal clothes. And <laughs> that was just my normal dancing. But hey, there we go. Right, so anyway, let's, uh, let's dig into this passage. So Luke chapter 7, starting at, at verse 11, and it picks up straight away with this, this soon afterwards, or some, um, some manuscripts say the next day. Um, 
So the question you ask then is, well, soon after what? What happened before? And if we rewind a little bit in Luke, go back to the beginning of chapter 7, we find Jesus is in Capernaum, uh, which is, is another town. And uh, the centurion, this Roman centurion, has come to him and said, Jesus, my, my servant is ill. Can you, can you heal him? And Jesus says, yeah, sure, and, and goes along. Um, and halfway there, uh, the centurion sends another slave. He goes, no, 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 don't, don't come into my house. I'm not worthy of that. Just give the word and my servant will be healed. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a soldier. I know what it means to give orders and have them obeyed. And you're just the same. I know you have that power. Uh, and Jesus is amazed by this and goes, you know, such faith. And indeed, he gives the word and the slave is healed. So then on the back of that, um, we, we read that Jesus the next day goes to this town called Nain. And what we know about Nain is, is that it wasn't very close to Capernaum. Um, we reckon it was about 30 miles away and, and up a pretty steep hill. And Jesus went there the next day. Uh, that, that's quite a route march, I think. To get, to get 30 miles uphill in a day is quite some going. Um, Reminds me of another joke, actually. Uh, at home at the moment, I can see. At home at the moment, I'm working on a model of, of Mount Everest. Um, it's not to scale, it's just to look at. I need someone on the drums. Anyway, there we go. <laughs> oh, lead balloon time, jolly good. So, anyway, and I, th I think there's an intentionality here, isn't there? You know, th this isn't an accident. Nain isn't on any main road. It's a backwater village in, in the kind of the middle of the hills. Jesus wasn't on his way to somewhere and passed Nain. He went to Nain. Uh, and we'll pick up a bit on this, this intentionality, I think, later when, when we look at what happens when he gets there. But he set off from Capernaum and, and headed straight, you know, direct mark, 30 miles, hike uphill, to get to this backwater village where there's nothing else going on and nothing else around. So uh, the other thing to mention then is that, of course, he had his disciples with him and also this large crowd who, who by implication, weren't disciples. They were just kind of tagging along to go, well, what's going on here? Um, so just, just we'll come back to the crowd again in a minute. So here he is then, and we move on to verse 12, and it says... As he approached Nain, this, this funeral procession came out the other way with another large crowd behind it. And, and this, I think, there's something in here about Jesus and his timing and his intention. Because he set out on this 30-mile walk uphill to get to this place. And he arrives there just as this funeral procession is coming out the other way. Um, I don't know what was going on in Jesus' mind, obviously. I don't know if he was prompted by the Spirit to make this journey and get there at that point. I don't know if, if he knew he had this divine appointment set up. But, but I think it, it is clear that this wasn't an accidental meeting. Jesus set out, I think, to meet that procession as it came out of that village. And you get these two crowds kind of meeting. You get the crowds coming behind Jesus who are presumably going, you know, what's going on here? What, what, who's this person? What's this about? And then you've got the crowd following the funeral procession who will be wailing and crying and, um, you know, in, in a dark place in a way. And you've got these two crowds with, with kind of Jesus and the funeral procession in the middle. And verse 12 is also, in one sense, the crux to our passage, because we find out that the funeral, the person who's on the funeral bier, is, is the only son of a woman, and she is a widow. Now, of course, we don't know the circumstances. We don't know, we don't know what's really going on. We don't know how the son died. We don't know how long ago her husband died. We don't really know the ages of the people involved. But, but what we do know is, is something of her predicament, uh, because the widow... In, in the Bible is, is, has a specific meaning. It's not just someone who's lost their husband. It's someone who has, has no support network, who has no family, who has, has no one to support her and look after her, no kind of extended group. She's someone who is really on her own. Um, and her son would have been her only support, her only possible source of income maybe, certainly the only one to look after her. And now he's gone as well. So, so she really is in a predicament. She, she's in a bad place. 
And I think strangely in that sense, the beneficiary of this miracle is not the son who's come back to life, wonderful as that is. I wonder if the beneficiary is actually the widow, if that's the person that Jesus is helping, that Jesus is doing this miracle for. We hear, don't we, that, that he's gripped with compassion, this kind of gut sense of, of, of being moved. And he says to her, don't cry. Of course, the whole sense of a widow with an only son and that son being raised back to dead had its echoes in the Old Testament as well. We can look back to um, the book of Kings and Elijah, the great prophet Elijah, uh, was staying with a widow and her son died and he brought the son back to life, uh, the widow of, of Zarephiah. You can read about it in 1 Kings 17. Uh, we see a similar miracle with Elisha, uh, who was Elijah's successor. Um, the, the son of a widow being brought back to life by God. And, and so there's this echo here that, that Jesus is in some sense a new prophet, a new Elijah, if you like. So then we go on to, as I say, verse 13, where Jesus is gripped by compassion and says, don't cry to the woman. And then we get to this really weird bit in verse 14, where it says Jesus touched the beer and stopped the procession. Um, and that's a really weird thing to do. Um, we kind of skip over it if we're not careful, but I was, I was reflecting on this, and when I was reflecting on this passage, this particularly jumped out at me. And it's, it's a bit like going out into the road and flagging down a hearse and stopping a funeral procession. Go, whoa, whoa, hold that, hold it there, hold it there, guys. To, to saying to the mourners, don't cry, guys, it's all right. And then kind of walking around the back, opening the doors, pulling the coffin out, opening it, and saying, right, up you get, lad. And it's, it's, it's an incredible thing to do. You, you just, I mean, the police would be called. I, I don't know what would happen. It, it's not a usual thing to do, to go in and go, just stop the procession. But, but this, is what, this is what Jesus does. And then he addresses the young person directly. He says, young man, get up. Young man, rise. And here we have a point of contrast with, with Elijah and Elisha. So in those prophets in the Old Testament, they prayed to God. They said, dear God, please bring your healing. Bring this, this person back to life. And, and God healed them and brought them back to life. Jesus doesn't. Jesus goes, rise, get up. And, uh, and there's a few other instances. There's two other instances, actually, we find in the gospel of Jesus raising people back from the dead. Um, there's one in Luke 8 where he raises Jairus' daughter and he does the same thing there. He says, little girl, get up. He addresses her. He addresses this dead person and says, get up. And then in John's gospel, towards the end of that, in John 11, um, in Lazarus, uh, he goes to the tomb and says, Lazarus, come out. Uh, he prays to God beforehand, but he says, that this, is a, this is for your benefit, so you know um, who I'm talking to. And then he says, Lazarus, come out. So Jesus, Jesus has, has the power to address people who are dead and to bring them back and to bring them back to life. And in verse 15, it said, he said he sits up and, and starts talking. Um, and let's be clear, that this young man, he really, he really was dead. He wasn't just in a coma or asleep. Um, you know, the funeral procession wouldn't, wouldn't have been, it takes a little while to organize these things. They would have known when someone was dead and they were carrying him. On, on the funeral bier to his final west resting place. But then he re also really was alive. He sat up, he started talking. Um, you know, Jesus has, has this power over death itself. Uh, and let's be clear, this isn't, this isn't a resurrection per se. So, so when Jesus was died and crucified, he came back from the dead and he was resurrected into a, into a new life. Um, that's not so much what's happening here. This is more of almost a resuscitation. So the, the young man in this story would have, would have come back to life, would have grown up, continued his life, and in the due course of events, died again. Um, and then, then we look to the final resurrection of the dead when, when we get our, our sort of our new bodies and our new life. But, but nevertheless, um, this was someone brought back to life who was dead. And we read the response to it in verse 16, that fear and awe seized the crowd. Um, and they, they began worshipping God. And what's interesting, I think, here is that um, the two crowds have almost now become one crowd. 
that Jesus has unified these two groups of people. The group of people who came up the hill with him, kind of going, what's going on? Uh, and the group of mourners coming out, come together to become one crowd who, who are glorifying God and are filled with awe, with fear, with wonder. It does remind me of another joke if we're talking about crowds. Because you, know, uh, you know, don't you, why, uh, why teenagers only go around in groups of three, five, or seven? Do you know why? It's because, like, they can't even. <laughs> anyway. And in verse 17, <laughs> um, I love maths jokes, what can you do? Uh, in verse 17, we, we read that, that, and the result of this, this praise is glory to God, the word spread about him. It spread about throughout the world, throughout the Judea and the countryside. So if that's kind of digging in into the passage to help us understand, you know, this quite short passage, some of the, the layers and, and what's going on behind it, um, the answer is, the question is always, of course, well, you know, so what? what? What does this mean for us today? Well, there's a few things that, that kind of came to my mind. Um, the first is that, that Jesus is, is compassionate. Um, I, I've heard Luke described as, as the gospel of tears. And certainly we, we see Jesus weeping. He weeps over Lazarus. He weeps over Jerusalem. He, he's moved by people's conditions. In, in the feeding of the 5,000, he's moved with compassion. Uh, we, we have this caricature, don't we, that God is, is some kind of remote old man uh, with a long beard sitting on a cloud somewhere, not really that interested in human affairs or looking down. And it's like, no, no, that, well, that's not the God I know. That's not the God I worship. The God I know and worship came down to earth and, and got kind of down and dirty, if you like, in the dust. He, he touched the funeral procession to stop it and brought someone back to life. He was moved. He cried. He was hungry. You know, th this is a God who, is, who lived and still lives among us and in us. So Jesus is, is deeply compassionate, I believe. Um, but also, his timing is not our timing. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I think if I was Jesus, I think if I had this incredible healing power, I, I kind of think I might have gone to Nairn a few days before, maybe the week before, and just saved all the heartache. It's like, don't worry, I'll heal your son. He doesn't need to die. That's fine. Um, but Jesus doesn't do that. And, and even in the other occasions where Jesus raises someone back from the dead, you, you see the same thing. With, with Jairus and his daughter, it's, uh, it's implicit, the timing. Uh, he's on his way to, to heal Jairus, Jairus' daughter, who, who's um, you know, very ill on her deathbed. And he gets waylaid by this other woman in the crowd, and he stops, and, and he ministers to her, and he talks to her. Um, you know, Jairus is there going, oh. um, And then, of course, in the meantime, the daughter sadly dies while Jesus is waylaid, and, and Jesus allows this to happen. But then he goes to the house and says, little girl, get up. And she does get up, and she's restored to life. I think it's even more explicit with Lazarus in John's Gospel, where, where Jesus act, actually says that he's not ready to go yet, because Lazarus has to die. Um, he, says, he says Lazarus has to fall asleep that we might wake him, and then explains actually he means Lazarus has to die. And when he gets there, Mary and Martha are going, why, God, why didn't you come? You could have saved him. Why did you wait for three days before you came? Uh, and, and the honest answer is I don't know. I don't fully understand why. Why Jesus' timing isn't our timing. Why God doesn't just um, kind of ride in on the white charger and, and make things better. Um, but what I do know is that God, I think, is interested in transformation and renewal, not, not in avoiding stuff. We don't get bubble wrapped. As, as God's followers. But he does promise a transformation and a renewal. I, I think Paul talks about it being like a seed. A seed has to be planted in the ground. It has to die before this new thing can grow. This new flower, you know, whatever it might be. And certainly when I look at my life, um, if I would want to pick out the, the times when I've grown the most, where I've matured, where I've become a, a better person, a deeper person, they've been the tough times. You know, they haven't been when it's easy and fun and I'm out sailing in the med or whatever it is that you might like to do that's just fun. Um, it's, it's just times that are really hard. That's when you have to dig deep. And I believe God brings transformation and renewal through that. 
And, uh, and I, I really commend to you, if, you know, if you're in a house group, then this, this is a, that's an ideal place to wrestle with some of this stuff and to go, you know, I don't understand what's going on here. Um, Alpha is another great opportunity just to ask these sort of questions and, and roll around in it a bit. But I think the main thing, um, you know, alongside Jesus being compassionate and that his, his timing isn't our timing, uh, and this is what I sort of provisionally titled this talk, is that Jesus does the impossible even after all hope is gone. That Jesus does the impossible even after all hope is gone. The, the widow was desperate. She was in a desperate situation. There was no hope for her. Um, one, one author I read suggested that, you know, had she spent the night in prayer, had she been lying on, her, on the floor in her room just saying, oh God, what, what am I going to do? Help. And it was Jesus answering that prayer when he set off for Capernaum to get there to meet her outside the village. I, I don't know. But I do know that Jesus does the impossible even after all hope is gone. And that, that's been true in my life when I've had times when it's felt hopeless. It's like, what, what, I just, I don't know what to do here. And, and Jesus, and stuff changes in ways that I could never have imagined or asked. So I think this is a, it, you know, it is, it is a difficult passage. It, it deals with, with deep issues. I think it shows us that Jesus is someone who is deeply compassionate. I think it shows that Jesus and God's timing isn't our timing. He doesn't go about things the way that we might choose to or want him to. But, but that there is always hope that Jesus does the impossible, even after all hope is gone. Mike, do you want to uh, come up and we can, uh, we can pray? It's our custom here to, um, to spend time and allow God to do what he wants to do. Uh, and so we do that um, by standing, and I'll invite you to stand in a moment. Uh, and the reason we ask people to stand is it gives you a more open posture.